very much, I think, as a scientist would. I mean, he finds some discovery and says, gosh, this is terrific. But then, as it were, the next day you come in and you realize, yes, but this is not going to, you know, get him on the back of the 10 pound note like Charles Darwin is, but that it's going to be part of a bigger picture. And we're always trying to work on small things to give us the overall view. My question is, like, how can we put those more together? Like, say if before we didn't call it evolution, or maybe we did call it evolution, but we, like, brought in, like, this was God's divine plan, and we, he made us change because of all this stuff. Would there be such, um, like, a division between that? I think you're still asking this question of, of, of accommodating both. Is that right? Of, of accommodating both. And I think what, what I was trying to say earlier, the reason why I, I thought I understood Father Wiseman's position is I was taught evolution by ordained priests. For many denominations, for many decades in this country, there's been uh, an accommodation. And I think it's a very interesting understanding to reach in terms of those, those individuals who hold both views, are very ser serious religious people, and fully accept the scientific position. Part of this exercise, I think, is to expose you and other people in the viewing audience to that line of thought, which I think has just not been put out there in, the public, in, in public forums. Um, I'm going to just follow up because I have a whole bunch of quotes from religious leaders that maybe will just, if you were brought up hearing these words, you or your family or any of your families, you might be thinking something different. And this is from the Bishop of Oxford. This is from the Anglican Church. So uh, this was a BBC thought for the day in 2002. And it was in reaction to a uh, movement in one school in England to, um, well, pretty much reject the teaching of evolutionary theory. And what the Bishop of Oxford, Richard Harris, pointed out, he said, quote, the theory of evolution, far from undermining faith, deepens it. This was quickly seen by Frederick Temple, later Archbishop of Canterbury, who said that God doesn't just make the world. He does something even more wonderful. He makes the world make itself. God has given creation a real independence, and the miraculous fact is that working is that working in relation to this independent life, God has, as it were, woven creation from the bottom upwards, with matter giving rise to life, life giving rise to conscious, reflective existence in the likes of you and me. Um, and then he, he goes on, and I'm not going to go over the rest of the quote about talking about um, the Bible, but he asks, you know, do people really think that there's a worldwide scientific community that's engaged in a massive conspiracy to hoodwink the rest of us? And so I think I've seen when, when members of the clergy and leaders of the clergy articulate a position that is, uh, you know, seriously in support of the, of the scientific knowledge, as at the, and at the same time are leading their flocks in, from a from a doctrine from a viewpoint of doctrine or theology, this I think really helps people deal with make make this sort of accommodation. When you see the theater on CNN at night, I don't think that's helping anybody. I don't think it changes anybody's minds. Maybe I think I've, I've got pretty much your your issue. Let me maybe add to what Sean said there because I I agree with everything he said. Um, in terms of just compatibility with belief in God and evolution couple statements. First of all, I deeply believe that truth is one and that you can never have, you know, and I believe that evolutionary theory is so well founded that I accept it as true. Now, that for me, a priori, that means that is not going to conflict with my belief in God. That also means, though, that I cannot understand God as some sort of puppeteer that just pulls all the strings and everything goes exactly in one particular way and that there's no freedom or no choice or no randomness. The greatest Catholic theologian ever was St. Thomas Aquinas who literally and explicitly said that there are many things in this world that occur by chance and he did not see that as at all incompatible with his understanding of divine providence and God's overall guidance. I believe, and I, th this is an image that some of you have probably heard before, that if somehow you understood the history of the universe is on a tape and you rewound it and then played it again, would it come out in exactly the same way? I don't think so. I, I think it was uh, Michael who pointed out that, you know, that 65 million years ago, if a meteor hadn't by chance hit the earth, it w we might not be here today. But I do believe myself, and I can't prove it, but there are good scientists who hold it, that there is, there seems to be enough in just the, the structure, the intelligible structure of the universe and what we call natural laws, that there is a certain drive towards 
the rise of intelligence. So whether Homo sapiens would have occurred again, I don't know, but I think there would have been intelligent life myself. Can I just Please. add one final thing here? Um, one of the big issues that Christians always wrestle with is what does it mean to say that God is eternal? And I think basically the position that many want to take is the same as perhaps not the greatest Catholic philosopher ever, but so a Catholic theologian ever, but the greatest Christian theologian ever, namely St. Augustine. And St. Augustine said his solution is that God is not in time. God, you shouldn't think of God as being very, very old and he's going to go on living forevermore. It's rather like God, you know, where does a circle begin and end? God is eternal. Now that means you cannot think then of God one day waking up and saying, oh, I think I'll create the earth. Oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Boom. Oh my gosh. Now what shall I do tomorrow, you know, for a follow-up? God doesn't work that way. The, for God, the idea of creation, the act of creation, and the completion of creation are as one. And St. Augustine, he wasn't an evolutionist in our sense, said this means that at some level the potentiality is there and has always been there. And what is happening on earth is an unfolding of that potentiality. And certainly many Christian theologians like Jack Hort at, um, at Georgetown University would say, yes, the best Christian theology, in fact, if anything, demands a developmental picture. It doesn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily follow that it would be Darwinism. That's for these people to do. It's not, the theologians aren't going to tell you how exactly the science works, but they would say that their theology, which comes from this very basic question about what does it mean to say God is eternal, means. So the, do, do recognize that there are major theological and philosophical reasons why evolution ought to be welcomed by believers. Sure. It's not just a question of, oh gosh, we've got to believe it. How can we do this? I'm going to go to the upper deck here in turquoise. Um, Dr. Roos mentioned the, briefly the issue of survival of the fittest and how that deals with issues of morality. Could you expand on that? What's that? Did you not hear the question? Yeah, no, not really. Survival, she said, of, the survival of the fittest. You, you, you touched upon it. There. I think you were talking about things like pain and yeah. pain and suffering and things like that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. right. Morality. Well, okay. Well, I'm not sure that pain and suffering are necessarily <coughs> the same as morality. Uh, but um, I, I, I mean, first of all, don't forget that it, whether you're a Darwinian or not, you're going to have to face up to the issue of pain and suffering. Even if you say, I think everything was created yesterday, you've still got the problem of pain and suffering today. So this is not something which is specifically a, a, an evolutionist problem or something that evolution uniquely introduces into the, uh, into the uh, what shall I say, the pot. Uh, already Christians have many sort of, what shall we say, counter moves that they would make. I mean, the most famous, of course, is with respect to uh, pain and suffering caused by humans, the whole question of free will. God gave us freedom. Unfortunately, freedom is going to lead to people doing bad things as well as good things. But God thought that or realized that it was better that we have freedom despite the pain and suffering than that we just be marionettes controlled by the DNA and no more. So that, now, whether or not you feel that that's an adequate answer overall, I think that it's certainly something that one can use, say, in the evolutionary context. Now, the, the traditional argument about pain and suffering in the physical world is, is, is due to the great philosopher Leibniz. And Leibniz said, to say that God is all-powerful is not to say that God can do the impossible. God may be all-powerful, but it does not mean that God can make 2 plus 2 equals 5. And the point is that if God, in fact, has created through law, then perhaps as a, as a consequence, we're going to have pain and suffering. I mean, pain and suffering is, it's a burning. If you sit on a, a hot stove or something, you're going to feel pain. But it's better to feel pain from sitting on a hot stove than to be sitting down and say, my God, that smells good, what's for supper? Uh, you know, so, uh, as I say, I think those would be the kind of moves that one would make. Very interestingly, the arch-evolutionary uh, atheist, Richard Dawkins, argues, and I think that he makes a good point here, he says that in his opinion, the only way that evolution can work is through natural selection.